Well, good morning, everyone. Turn your Bible with me, please. Let me just make sure all this is on. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter. That's where we're starting all of these lessons as we think about growth and as we think about growing in the Lord so that we can be effective in His service and so that we can love Him and serve Him in an even better way. It's Ephesians chapter 4 that I'm going to begin with in just a moment. It's been a joy to be with you on Friday and Saturday. All kinds of amazing and wonderful people are here and encouraging to me in so many ways. It's a delight to have my wife Dina here. And I will tell you this, we did not miss fiddling with our clock last night at all. I am going home to preach the gospel of Arizona. This actually works. I think that was just absolutely incredible. Let's be in the Word of God and let's think about Ephesians, the fourth chapter, please. This is verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is at the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As we've worked together and as we've thought about the things that we want to be growing in, you probably noticed that on Sunday morning we're going to talk about evangelism. And I know that's a situation and a topic that makes a lot of us squirmy and kind of uncomfortable. Lots of things about evangelism seem to be, when we talk about that and teach and preach about that, seem to be impressing upon us the need maybe to go to the other side of the world and talk to people in deepest, darkest Australia or Africa or some foreign country and you got to have a passport and you got to learn another language and we're in a little uncomfortable. I don't know, I have to quit my job and pack a snake bite kit? I, I don't know if I want to do that. Or, or maybe, maybe we get a lot of discussion about accosting strangers. You just see somebody in the supermarket and you just need to go up to them and buttonhole them and get a Bible study. And well, I don't know how to do that and I'm uncomfortable doing all of that. And so now preacher comes and says we're going to grow in evangelism and we're ready to hear maybe those kinds of conversations, those kinds of topics. Well, I want to say to you this morning, that I'm very vitally interested in all of us being involved in the great work of evangelism. And I am interested in all of us being missionaries as we grow in Christ to help others come to know what we know and what we have come to see and understand in Jesus the Christ. But I think there are ways for us to do evangelism right where we are without becoming something that we are not, having to adopt some weird false persona that seems artificial and strange. There are some opportunities presented to us with technology that gives all of us the chance to do some serious growth in our evangelistic efforts without all the discomfort and the strangeness that goes with traveling around the world or, or knocking on doors or some of these techniques in evangelism that are, just, that are just difficult for most of us. Most of what I'm going to say today is just common sense kinds of things. In many ways, I think we're making evangelism way too hard. There's just some things that we can do as Christians, again, particularly with technology, that I think is enormously helpful to us. So as I'm looking at the body growing in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, growing so that it builds itself up in love, I want to talk with you about being a missionary. But I want to talk with you about being a digital missionary. That's an area that we can all do some growth in and we can do some powerful evangelistic kinds of things. And as I say that, maybe the thing for me to do is to just start with this. Maybe we just need to recognize God doesn't want everyone to be a missionary. Now maybe that seems completely contradictory to how I started the sermon. I want you to be a missionary. Now on the screen it says God doesn't want everybody to be a missionary. But you know, that's just the truth. That is absolutely the truth. If you look with me in Acts 13, let's get our Bibles going. In Acts the 13th chapter, I'm reading in Acts 13, there was in the church, this is Acts 13 and verse 1, there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, and also Manaen, and also Manaen of Herod the Tetrarch, and also Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. After fasting and praying, they laid hands on them, and they sent them off. Do you see that the business of going into virgin territory where there were no congregations at all, not everybody was called to do that. God didn't send everybody. 
A bunch of people stayed in Antioch and continued to build that church in Antioch to be a thriving church that could support the kinds of efforts that Acts 13 then details from Barnabas and Saul. We need to see going out and preaching to people who've never heard the gospel, doing that kind of work, that's complicated and that's difficult. In fact, in James 3, in James chapter 3 and verse 1, in James 3 and verse 1, despite how so often we say everybody ought to be teaching the gospel to somebody, James actually says in James 3 and verse 1, not many of you should become teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. One of the greatest mistakes in Christianity is thinking that everybody, if you, if you were really a good Christian, you'd be heading out to the Amazon somewhere. I don't think the Bible teaches that in any shape, form, or fashion. The Bible actually shows as Paul moves from place to place and establishes churches in Thessalonica and churches in Corinth, churches in Philippi, that those people don't all quit their jobs and go out to the outer skirts and the outer reaches of the Roman Empire and begin to preach it. No! No, those people stay right where they are and begin to have influence on the people that they are around. That's a key term influence. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 5. In Matthew chapter 5 as part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in Matthew 5. Let's load up Matthew 5 in verse 14. Jesus says, you are the light of the world, Matthew 5 and verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I want you to notice that that passage is not just for the apostles. That passage is for everybody. Disciples are listening to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, and this speaks of being an influence for the kingdom of God, being an influencer. Now, I use that term advisedly, but I think in some ways it works. Do you know what an influencer is? All these young people know about influencers. Here's an influencer. This is a picture of a young man. His name is Ryan Kaji. He is 12 years old. He is an incredible social media influencer. You know what he does? He unboxes and plays with toys and demonstrates that on YouTube. Here's one of his early videos where he's playing with a McDonald's playset. And for those of you who are sitting in the back and can't see exactly how many views that has had, that has had, yeah. 78,900,000 views. Ryan Kaji has 33 million subscribers to his YouTube channel. His YouTube videos have been viewed over 5 billion, with a B, 5 billion times. When you have 32 million people who watch your videos, then toy companies will send you free toys. And when you monetize that with advertising and clicks, you can make all kinds of money. Last year, Ryan Kaji made $30 million off YouTube. Here's a parenting tip. Next time your kid says, hey, I need a raise in allowance, start your YouTube channel, son. <laughs> Ryan Kaji exercises tremendous influence and he's doing all of that without all kinds of fancy equipment. He doesn't need a production truck or a studio. He started all of that with a camera on his phone, began to upload those videos. Parents wanted to see, does a kid really like that toy? Is that a good toy? Does it break? People are watching that. It grew from there. 30 million subscribers, 78 million views for that video alone. Now I'm willing to guess that you don't have on your Facebook account or on your TikTok account, your Instagram account, you probably don't have 30 million followers. But you have some, don't you? What if we began to use social media to be an influencer? Because everybody's on social media. In 2008, only 10% of Americans had a social media account. That number now is 79% and rising. What that means is 88% of 18 to 29 year olds 
are on social media and 30 to 49 year olds, 78% of them have a social media account. Those numbers are steady. 69% of 50 to 64 year olds are on social media. 40% of folks with silver in their hair, that's right, they're on social media. My mom, she's an incredible grandma, she's an amazing great grandma. She wants to see what her grandkids are doing, what her great grandkids are doing. She is on Instagram. She knows how to run that because she wants to see what's going on. It's everywhere. All kinds of people are using this. In fact, 74% of people use Facebook every single day. 72% of people use YouTube every day and 63% of people are on the gram every single day. Those numbers are unbelievable. You're literally talking about a percentage of the people on the planet who are using social media all the time. Maybe it's time for us to think about being an influence for the kingdom of God with our social media. Have you considered that? That we could use social media to go into all the world. That we can have influence for Jesus Christ on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. We could be there with the gospel message. Now, as I'm talking about that, somebody's saying, well, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm just not on social media. In fact, sometimes I hear Christians, they brag, I'm not on that social media, like that's a good thing. Can I ask you a question? If more than 70% of people are on social media, why aren't we on social media? influencing people for the kingdom of God. Can you imagine Paul saying, oh, I'm not doing that mail thing. Roman mail system, I don't know. Got to mess with papyrus, seal that up, find a curry. Oh, I don't want to be on that kind of thing. I'm not going to use the mail system. The mail system in Paul's day absolutely was the technology that was available. And Paul used it relentlessly to influence Christians for the gospel of Christ, to build churches stronger. He was an influence for the kingdom, not just personally going around the world. No, he used technology to reach out and encourage people in the gospel. Think about a missionary arriving in a village maybe in Africa or South America, no electricity, very primitive, but in the middle of the village, there's a bulletin board. And everybody posts on the bulletin board. Any kind of community meeting, any kind of opportunity, he goes down there and he looks. The Buddhists, they've posted some things about their meeting. The Jehovah's Witnesses have posted things about what they're doing at the Kingdom Hall. All kinds of things are there. The missionaries say, you know, I'm not doing that bulletin board thing. I don't want to mess with thumbtacks. I don't want to have to print up a flyer and print it and put it up here. And besides, if I got involved in that, you know what? I'd just end up standing down here reading the bulletin board all day. So I'm just not doing the bulletin board. I say again, if everybody's on social media, why aren't Christians on social media? So that we can be an influence for the kingdom of heaven. So that we can help people. So we can be, verse 14, a light of the world. So that we can be salt and light, verse 13. So we can show our light before others, verse 16. In fact, sometimes people will say things like, well, you know, I just don't know how to do that. Well, what if we decided that the gospel is so important we will learn how to do that because we want to be an influence for the kingdom. And God has blessed us with this incredible technology where in the palm of our hand, sitting on the couch, you can go around the world influencing folks for the kingdom of heaven. What if we decided, I need to know how to do this? Well, someone says, oh, that social media. There's so much bad on social media. And you know what? You're right. There's a lot of bad stuff on social media, which means it seems to me that we as Christians ought to get on there and get some good stuff on there, shouldn't we? Technology gives us the ability to be influencers for Jesus Christ. Now, I should say this, particularly because there's some young person here who's been begging mom and dad to let them on TikTok, let them on Instagram, let them on Facebook. And they're thinking, this is the best sermon I have ever heard. 
And I do want to say that there are difficulties, like with any technology, there are difficulties. It is a tool, and it needs to be used wisely and with discretion. Moms and dads need to make good choices about what their children are ready for and to be age appropriate, all the things that go with that. But particularly as we climb into adulthood, and we are using social media to see what our friends are doing, to say things about what we're doing in our own lives, there is an unprecedented opportunity. What would the Apostle Paul say if he knew with a box in your hand you could preach and teach the gospel 24-7, 365 days a year, absolutely free? You think Paul would post memes about cats? Or would Paul use social media to be an influence for the kingdom of heaven? That's a challenge for us. If we're going to do that, though, what we'll have to do is we're going to have to think like a missionary. We're going to have to think like a missionary. This is a coming out of Acts 16. Can you turn your Bible with me over to the 16th chapter of Acts? In Acts 16, as Paul is preaching the gospel, he comes to Derby and Lystra, Acts 16, verse 1, and there was a disciple there, Acts 16 and verse 1, named Timothy. He was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now what? Wait a minute, he did what? Went a little surgery there? What's that about? What that is about is that Paul knew Timothy would not be able to enter the synagogue since he was uncircumcised. And where does Paul always go when he comes to town? What's the first place Paul visits? He always goes to the synagogue. Because he knows that in the synagogue, he's going to find like-minded people, people who believe in the Bible. The Old Testament is the Bible of Paul's day. And he can begin there to proclaim the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, to people who are looking for the Messiah. That's his natural beginning point. But Timothy can't do that because he's not been circumcised. So if it took a little surgery to get the door open for Timothy, Paul and Timothy were more than willing to do that. That's the missionary mindset. The missionary mindset is all about how can I fit into this culture? How can I become credible with these people so that I can influence them with the gospel? When missionaries arrive at their destination, what they do is they start learning. In fact, good missionaries start learning before they even arrive. They want to know what's the language. What are the local taboos? I don't want to do things unintentionally that would offend and close off opportunities. How should I dress? What's an appropriate dress in this place? How can I build relationships? How can I get my foot in the door? What missionaries want to do is they want to influence people for Christ so they do everything they can to accommodate themselves to the culture where they will be. That's the principle in 1 Corinthians 9. In 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, hear what Paul has to say about his work as a missionary. In 1 Corinthians 9, this is in verse 20 where he says, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 20, To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. And to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though myself not being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Now a big part of being a missionary is what Paul describes right there. It's just being aware of what's going on around you so that you don't unintentionally hack people off and push people away with your lack of understanding so that you don't even get a hearing for the gospel. Several years ago I got to travel to South Africa to do some preaching there. And we're in Zululand and one of the big customs among the Zulus is that we all get to someone's house after church and we're going to eat, going to have a big potluck. Well, I know how potluck works. You know how potluck works. You go down the line, you got your plate, and you just start putting food on it and so forth. Get what you want. I don't need any of that broccoli. Just terrible. Can't be having any of that. Well, not in Zululand. In Zululand, the ladies stand behind the table. They take your plate, and they put food on the plate. 
And you don't say, I don't want. Mm. Man, my plate got to the end of the row. There's a lot of stuff on it. I don't even know what some of that stuff was. I ate it all. I ate it all. Did not want to offend anybody by being thoughtless and callous. Now, we need to take that mindset then, if we're going to use social media, we have to carry that missionary mindset when we get on Facebook, when we climb on Instagram, when we begin to use that digital device. And sometimes I see Christians not thinking very much like a missionary when they get on social media. They're not influencing people for the gospel. They're influencing people for something else, like, like a particular political viewpoint. Have you seen any of those kinds of posts? This candidate that I didn't vote for is a complete moron. He's ruining America. What about all the people who did vote for him when they see that post? Can you now influence them for the gospel now that you have made them angry? What about whatever the hot button issue is of the day and there's always a new hot button issue? If you don't agree with my take on this issue, you disgust me. Now I really have the ability to say, hey, would you come to the gospel meeting with me? Just ludicrous, isn't it? Are we interested in influencing people for Jesus Christ? Or are we interested in influencing people for our political viewpoint? Or for fo folks to come around and understand that we think this celebrity's behavior is awful? Or that we don't like this take on whatever the current issue is that everybody's raging about on social media? Or how about this? What about people who are posting religious stuff in giant block letters? Have you seen those? If you're not baptized, you're not a Christian. I can't even tell you. How many people have showed up at Westside and knocked on the door? I need to be baptized. I saw somebody said, if you're not baptized, you're not a Christian. I need to be... You know how many people have knocked on our door at Westside? Zero. Nobody does that. That's just off-putting. That just makes people angry. Who is this person to say I'm not a Christian? They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand about baptism. Here's somebody just labeling them and pushing them away. It just makes people mad. Why do we imagine that if we climb onto social media and shout and scream and rant like everybody else is doing, that somehow that draws people to the gospel, that somehow that will draw people to Jesus the Christ. Look at me. I'm angry about everything. Don't you want to be like me? What's the answer to that? Unfollow? No. No one wants to be like that. We need to think like a missionary. If we're going to get on social media, we want to think about weak people, verse 22. How can I win the weak? We need to think about the Jews. I can become as a Jew, verse 20. To those outside the law, verse 21. I need to think about everybody who's going to read this. Not just my friends. Not just other Christians who understand my viewpoint. Who can I convert to Jesus Christ? Who will see this post? And how will it affect my ability to say something to them at some point about reading the Bible, about coming to church, about knowing Jesus Christ. Which means if I'm going to be a digital missionary, I want to be involved in strategic posting. Somehow my slides here are not exactly the same order that I want them to be in, but I'll say something about strategic posting here. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. While I figure out why my Jeep is showing here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, in 2 Corinthians 4 and in verse 5, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, Paul says this. He talks here about what missionaries press, what missionaries are interested in showing people. And he says in 2 Corinthians 4 and in verse 5, there he says, We proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So this is an important principle. Missionaries don't go places to talk about themselves. Look at me. I want you to be like me. Missionaries go places to talk about Jesus. They don't post themselves. And maybe in some ways this makes it a particular challenge to use social media because social media is what? And social media usually is all about me. Look at me. The original social media page was called My Space. And Facebook, the word face in Facebook means what? Look at my face. 
Look at my amazing life. Look at my amazing vacation. Look at my amazing dinner I cooked. Look at my amazing kids. Me, 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 me. And I want you to understand, me, 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 me is not the gospel. We want to talk to people about Jesus. We want to post strategically to help people think in spiritual terms and begin to have that, what do some people call it, that rock in the shoe. We try to put a rock in people's shoe where it's just nagging at them all the time. What do I know about the Bible? Why am I not more of a spiritual person? Why am I not interested in spiritual values? Why don't I go to church somewhere? What do I know about Jesus? We're trying to get people to think in those kinds of terms. But I don't want you to misunderstand in any shape, form, or fashion. That doesn't mean that we don't ever have anything to say about our life. Of course we have some things to say about our life. When missionaries show up in a village, what do they do? They start becoming part of that community. They try to interact with that community and they try to enmesh themselves in those people. And they want people to see that they're real. That the gospel doesn't make you an alien. You don't grow antennas off the top of your head. You're an ordinary person. You're just different because of the gospel in your life. So I'm not afraid to post things on my Facebook page that show I'm a regular guy. Dean and I own a wonderful red Jeep. We were in Colorado a couple of weeks ago and the Aspens were changing. Absolutely fabulous. And I'll put that up because I want people to know the gospel doesn't mean you're never going to enjoy life again. And we do have incredible grandchildren, which we love to put on social media all the time. We're getting ready for a Cowboy playoff game, which they lost. And we had everybody dressed up in all of our cowboy gear. We just love that kind of stuff. We're just going to show people all the time. That's my newest granddaughter. And we just want people to know we are part of the community. We care about local sports teams. We take a vacation and go see God's creation. We have grandkids. And you know, if something really strange happens, like, I don't know, maybe you're in Israel and you meet the weirdest looking Bedouin that you ever saw. <laughs> I'm going to put that on social media. I'm going to put that up because I want people to know that Mark is involved in life and Mark is living life in the name of Jesus. But I am certainly not going to let that dominate my social media. What I want to dominate my social media is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want people to see that I'm concerned about Jesus, that I'm doing things to encourage people to think in spiritual terms. What can I do to help folks think more about the spiritual dimension of life? Let me see here if I can give you a couple of ideas that will help you in that direction. First and foremost, this is a given, isn't it? There's not anything on your social media going to contradict the mission. The mission is to influence people for Jesus Christ. If people see on my social media that I'm involved in partying and revelry, if I'm involved in immodesty and all kinds of craziness, how are they possibly going to take seriously that I say you need to be a Christian? What's the number one thing non-Christians say about Christians? They're all a bunch of hypocrites. If they see on your social media page that you're a hypocrite, your influence is destroyed. James 1.27 talks about being unspotted from the world. By the way, that includes the TV shows and the shows that you binge and the movies that you go to. You jump on social media and say, hey, we just saw this show. It is just so amazing. I just love this show. I turn that show on and it's full of all kinds of filthy language. What's that about? Why are you praising that show? I watch this comic. Every other word is bleep this and bleep that. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you were a Christian. Well, I guess not. Secondly then, more than just leaving stuff off, I want to put stuff on social media that will show people I'm a serious follower of Christ. I want to do that on a regular basis. Read this in the Bible today. Or what about this? When I'm at church, I could check in. Just click. It's up on Facebook. Mark's at church today. That lets everybody know I'm consistent in my worship attendance, maybe somebody at some point in their life is going to be looking for some spiritual direction. They've seen over and over and over again, I'm a church, I'm a church. They've seen me post Bible verses. They've seen me post something about Jesus. When they need spiritual direction, who are they going to turn to? See the influence that we can have? What about this? Could I post something then that would help people be more interested in being a Christ follower? I'm thinking here about needs. 
There's so much anxiety in this world. There's so much fear. Can I say something about how the gospel helps me cope with the trials and tribulations of this life? There's so much loneliness in this world today. Can I post something about what it is to be part of an incredible family of God's people who sustain and support and help each other? There's so much, we talked about this Friday night, there's so much hopelessness in this world. What could I post about the hope of the gospel that would be attractive to somebody who's feeling the despair of our secular times? Finally, how could I be a positive influence in this negative world? When people get on social media, you know what they're hoping to see? They're hoping to see more negativity. They're hoping to see more angry people shouting about everything. They're hoping to hear more stuff about how everybody else is wrong. No, they're not. Nobody needs more wet blankets thrown on their life. We've all got plenty of problems. We've all got plenty of trials. I don't need any more discussion of that. But when somebody comes on social media and they are a ray of sunshine, they're talking about how good it is to be in church. What do you mean it's good to be in church? Really? This person likes going to church. Highlight of their week. What about that? That's a little different take. Somebody sharing a verse of scripture about the love of God. Wow, that just, that just made me feel a little bit better about my life today. How can I be a positive influence in such a negative world? I want to post very strategically. I'm not going to post anything that's going to push anybody away, even if they don't vote like I vote, even if they don't have the same economic background, even if they're not the same skin color as me. I'm not going to do anything to push people away. Instead, I'm going to post stuff that will draw people, not to me, to the gospel, to the difference Jesus has made in my life. Can I give you some ideas about some of that? In posting, shorter is better. Shorter is always better. If you're posting a 400-page thesis on why baptism is essential to salvation, no one is reading that. Not on social media, they're not. Quick and short always works better. And you want to be yourself. You want to be yourself. Sometimes there's a lot of sharing of somebody else. We just repost what somebody else shows. But, but that's Sean's voice. That's somebody else's voice. What about you? How has the gospel affected you? You need to post about the gospel in your life. That makes you a light. That makes you real. And as you're doing that, don't judge people or push people away. Don't want to say things that are going to cause people to be unhappy. To say, hey, I'm unfollowing this person. Going to get a lot of different kinds of comments and so forth. We want to try to bring people in, not in some way shove them outside. And that does mean we are not arguing online. Do not argue on Facebook. Have you seen this kind of thing? Somebody posts something and then here come the trolls. You do this kind of social media work and the devil's going to be active. He's going to send the trolls after you. They just want to argue. They have nothing better to do with their life than take you on. Oh, you Christians think you're the only ones going to heaven. Oh, you think the Bible's the word of God. They're nasty and they're mean. Do not argue online. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get anywhere. Somebody has said that arguing online is like yelling across the football stadium at somebody. Hey, I never heard what you said. You're so... Nobody can hear that. There's other comments in the way. Hey, 15 comments back up. You said this and I want to reply. Oh, it's so confusing. Proverbs talks about not arguing with the fool. Somebody jumps on there and saying, oh, the Bible is a bunch of myths and fables. You need to message them and say, hey, I have some good reasons why I believe in the Bible. Let me message you directly about that. Let me email with you about that. Let's get a cup of coffee and let's talk about that. But we're not arguing with people online, getting nasty and getting ugly. It always helps your post if you have a picture. It doesn't even matter what the picture is. But Facebook particularly prioritizes postings with pictures. Get a picture of the Bible. Get a picture of church building. Get a picture of yourself. Get a picture of a butterfly. Any picture will help your post. The algorithms will show it to more people. What about, what about, what about, do something dramatic. There we go. What about podcasting? You listen to podcasts? Podcasts are red hot right now. So hot. Lots and lots of people listen to podcasts. If you don't know about a podcast, podcast is like a radio show that you can listen to when you want. 
So that means people listen to podcasts when they're exercising, when they're doing dishes, when they're mowing the grass, they just put their earbuds in. They're able to listen to the content they want when they want. If you're listening to a good spiritually minded podcast, you need to post that podcast up. You need to recommend that podcast. Gentlemen, listen to me. One of the hardest demographics to reach is men. Our culture does a great job of saying only sissies go to church. And so a lot of young men in particular are like, I'm not going to be a part of that. But do you know who is the dominant audience for podcasts? Men. Men listen to podcasts. There's a lot of great podcasts out there that will help people begin to be introduced to the concepts of the kingdom of God. You listen to that podcast, you need to put that podcast, you need to put a link up and say, I'm listening to this and this is helping my life. You need to post that up. And then, of course, you can always say something about a class or about a sermon. Oh, Brother Sean brought the Word of God today. I'd never seen this in this passage before. That really helped me. People are not used to seeing positive things said about the church and about the assembly. And that, of course, means... Wow, Facebook and me are, PowerPoint and me are not getting along this morning. Let's be positive about the church, even if PowerPoint doesn't work really well. Let's just talk about how great it is to worship. Let's talk about how great it is to be in God's family. Let's talk about the kind of things that we are doing in the kingdom. And let's talk about daily Bible reading. We had a big discussion about that last night. You're reading the Bible. You're pathing those chapters. You're drawing closer to the Lord. Say something about that. Don't have to... Type out 3,000 words on that. Nobody's going to read that. Shorter is better. But you can drop a quick line in there. This verse really spoke to me today. I'm so thankful for the Word of God. That positions you in people's minds as a serious disciple reading the Bible. Finally, well, you want to get serious about this? PowerPoint doesn't. How about get serious about this? It's going to say, ask if you can pray for somebody. I'm totally lost. Oh, wow. Then also, of course, all of a sudden it went, there we go. Ask, how can I pray for you? That's a big ask. There's a lot of people who are hurting, a lot of people in a lot of need. You get on there and you say, I'm willing to pray for you. People will say, I need this. Could you help me with this? Would you pray about this? You know what we do about that? We pray about it, and then we message them with the prayer that we said. I held your name up before God today in prayer, and this is what I said. See how intentional that is? See how we can use social media to help people get closer to the kingdom of God. And again, I wonder sometimes why we make evangelism harder than it really is. We don't have to go to the other side of the planet. We don't have to do crazy things that feel artificial and forced. And we're awkward, and of course the person we're talking to, they feel all of those vibes as well. We have the opportunity, because of the technology that we're blessed with today, to gently encourage people, think about the gospel. I want to remind you, right here, this is where the preacher tells that incredible story of that person who obeyed the gospel that you never would have expected would obey the gospel simply because somebody was posting on Facebook. And you know what? I have some of those stories. Westside's a wonderful church. We have some incredible people who love the Lord. And we have some of those stories. But it's not about baptisms, folks. It's not about conversion. No. It's about our effort to plant the seed. God takes it from there. Here's my last verse in the class will be yours. Lesson will be yours in 1 Corinthians 3. If you'll look with me in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in verse 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I planted and Apollos watered. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And he who plants, he who waters are one. Each one will see wages according to his labor. We're not in the baptism business. We're in the seed planting business. And technology and social media gives us the opportunity to scatter seeds so far. Post, 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 pray, pray, pray. Don't worry. Someone says, well, how many people? That's not your business. God will take it from there. We need to be faithful as we grow in our evangelistic efforts. Let's pray about that. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, our God, we're thankful you've blessed us in a time where we have tools where we can reach so many with the great news of your Son. And we ask, Father, that you bless our efforts to be more faithful in using those tools. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we are going to close this part of our worship today with an invitation to become a child of God.
to be involved in the kingdom of God because you are following Jesus the Christ. That begins in the waters of baptism with repentance and faith. You can have your sins washed away this morning, as Acts 2.38 teaches. You can be a Christian. If you are a Christian, your life isn't what it ought to be. Yeah, really hard to do evangelism when you're not doing what you should be doing as a disciple. You need to get that fixed today, don't we? We'd love to help you serve the Lord or serve the Lord in a better way. Make your way down front while we stand, while we sing.